All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today as we explore the good, the bad, and the ugly domestic and international freight market update. I want to give a special shout out to all of our customers and our audience today for making this seminar the most atten attended webinar we've hosted. Uh, thank you again. My name is Matt Foster, and I recently joined M33 Integrated Solutions from a large 3PL in the industry. I bring with me a vast knowledge of the domestic and international transportation market with a passion of staying in tune with current regulations and economic trends. Today we are going to be discussing many topics and I encourage you to submit questions throughout the presentation and I'll answer them at the end. We've also had a few topic suggestions from the registration so if you uh, don't hear a topic of interest please let me know after the presentation and we will go over that one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. My goal is to review current market conditions and future trends in all modes such as truckload, LTL, air, rail, and ocean. Uh, we also will explore recent regulation changes that can impact your supply chain, such as the Highway Bill and CSA. I will then briefly touch on some international trade aspects, as that could be of interest to your business, such as protection from piracy and tax regulations. Finally, I will leave you with a few tips to manage through a tight capacity market. But before we begin, I would like to make this a very interactive seminar and ask everyone a poll question. What mode are you utilizing the most? Let's go ahead and spend just a couple seconds here and answer that question and we'll review the results. All righty, well thanks for all the responses. It looks like we have 54% of you using truckload the most, with a close LTL at 31%. Uh, not much air intermodal, but we'll talk about that as possible modal conversions throughout the presentation. And then international at 15%. So that's good to hear. Thank you. Now let's continue on with uh, trucking. Analysts are seeing a 5.6% increase in costs year over year and increased volumes of 3.5%. There are more than 26 million trucks on the road, and one in every 15 people working in the U.S. are employed by the transportation industry. So it's interesting to look at capacity planning using business intelligence, peak seasons, and constraints within your current model. Equipment pricing, believe it or not, also plays a unique role in capacity. The average retail price of a five-year-old truck in 2010 was $36,600. Last year, it was $48,600. And this year, they're going for $58,100. Let me ask you, when was the last time your car appreciated in value? Capacity in the over-the-road sector is in a tenuous equilibrium. Therefore, the railroad industry invested billions of dollars to have the capacity to pick up the slack as the recovery gains momentum. Truckload capacity, though, has increased 21% over last year. Rates will continue to rise in 2012 and 2013. Um, and we could have even a repeat of 2004 and 2014. I wanted to share this market demand index to indicate that the MDI has increased 11% since the beginning of the year. And as you can see below, a demand over 7.0 on this chart favors carriers. Now there's that famous slogan, I'm sure you've seen it on the highway, trucks bring it. Over 90% of our consumables are delivered via truck at some point during transit. All right, so who has turned down business in the last year? Well, LTL companies. They are purposely cutting capacity year over year, refusing lower price freight to improve margins. Their goal is to improve profitability over market share. The LTL market is a $27.5 billion business with FedEx holding the largest share at $4.4 billion. Volumes are up 24% over 2010 because people are shipping less quantities as truckload or mode conversions. The rates are continuing its upward trend. I love LTL though for their live updates. It allows us to be proactive and we can rescue shipments when they're delayed. Technology takes out a cost driver 
and creates efficiencies within your organization using a TMS to auto rate and tender shipments. Claims. It's very important to know your contracted limitations of liability. It varies with each carrier. Uh, I suggest that you negotiate for around $25 a pound for cargo insurance with LTL carriers. Now, one of my favorite things to talk about is the biggest secret in the industry. Um, getting an FAK or more so an item 171, which is the bump rule. My first recommendation is the FAK, though. It stands for freight of all kinds. It allows multiple freight classes within a range to ship at the same class. It facilitates easier pricing and billing communication between the shipper and the carrier. Negotiating FAKs are a huge advantage in securing the lowest rates for customers. Now, bumping. This is pretty neat because it's the declaration on the original bill of lading of an artificially higher weight for the purpose of causing a higher density that allows your shipment to be bumped to a lower class rating. Now, it can only be applied, though, to commodities with classes based on density and then those that is made reference to item 171 and the NMFC guide. So if you have any other questions on how to calculate that, I'd be happy to help you out with that. We have another poll question. This is going to be related to air freight. What costs more to ship? A pound of gold, a pound of feathers, or this is a trick question. A pound's a pound, so they're equal. Go ahead and spend a couple seconds right now answering that, and I will uh, let you know the results. All righty. Well, thank you very much. Let's see what the results show. 64% of our audience thinks it costs more to ship via air a pound of feathers, and they are correct. Air freight is based on dimensional weight. So even though a pound of gold technically weighs the same as a pound of feathers, a pound of feathers would take up more dimensional space within that aircraft. So it was a fun question. And air, it's a beautiful mode. Um, it's the fastest way to get goods from point A to point B. Airlines have unique control of their capacity and can easily shift to smaller, more efficient aircraft based on demand. Volumes have decreased 4.2% since last year because shippers typically use this mode for those oops moments or expedited needs. So why are rates down? Supply and demand. Shippers are converting to Ocean or LTL, but I expect them to go up. For example, I mean, when the new iPad 3 was released, the air freight rates from China to the U.S. went up a dollar per kilo. As um, a few suggestions here, I suggest that you also work on becoming a known shipper with the TSA so that you can utilize commercial airline space for reduced costs in your transportation spend on uh, commercial airline space. But you can also partner up with the 3PL, or deferred air carrier, that uses both air and over the road for expedited LTL needs that's referred to as deferred air. Now, the tip of the day, if you are a consistent air shipper, definitely want to talk to your provider about reserving a ULD, which is a universal loading device, to leverage cost savings uh, to partner with providers that have gateways rather than shipping your cargo loose. All right, let me ask you a question. Who bought a railroad recently? Warren Buffett. Listen to this genius. There is 150,000 miles of tracks in the U.S. alone. Major shipping companies also utilize the rail. Traffic is up 3.5% with gains for 30 straight months. We can now efficiently ship freight on the rail as little as 500 miles away because of the consistent rail infrastructure investment, especially in the Eastern Corridor. Rates are predicted to rise 3 to 5%, but the rail is ready to take on excess freight when over the road cannot handle the volume thanks to their flexible capacity with freight cars in storage. Now, there's a famous CSX slogan, which is pretty neat. One ton of freight, 423 miles on one gallon of fuel. Absolutely incredible. It just shows you how environmentally efficient the rail is. 
All right, some international shipping updates. High capacity and low demand equals low rates. It's all good, right? Wrong. There were 156 vessels idled in 2011 that mounted to $11.4 billion in losses last year. Container volumes totaled 6.91 million 20 equivalent units, which are TEUs, in 2011, up 11.2% from the previous year. However, their revenue was down 11% year over year. So it's an interesting fact, but shippers are converting their air freight to ocean to take advantage of these cheaper rates at the moment. So what's on the horizon? Well, the carriers have controlled their capacity to increase rates in 2012, an average of 39% since January of this year, according to Alpha Liner, thanks to four general rate increases that have held strong. That next GRI starts on July 1st. Now, we also want to keep an eye out for peak season surcharges starting in late August for the holiday season. All right, CSA. We've been hearing about it since, well, it was called CSA 2010. It's an FMCSA initiative to improve safety performance of motor carriers and drivers so there are fewer fatalities, crashes, and injuries. Now, I expect some rulemaking to happen in February or March 2013 on this, with a final rule in another 12 to 14 months. Uh, the CSA will measure the safety performance of carriers in a whole new way. Carriers will receive a monthly score in the eight basics criteria. For the first time, the carrier score will be directly impacted by the actions of the individual drivers. Carriers will know their score and be ranked against their peers there will be levels of intervention ranging from a warning letter to an investigation to out of service. Now, the old system only used four categories, assessing only violations from roadside inspections. They're graded as unsatisfactory, conditional, or satisfactory. Now, the new criteria is going to be unfit, marginal, or no known safety deficiencies. So, what kind of effect is CSA going to have? It's highly uh, skeptical at the moment, but trucking companies have already begun preparing. They have terminated drivers whose records would be impacting their, their score, thus reducing driver supply. Insurance premiums are going up. Their cost of operations are going up with driver pay increases, and especially with the equipment on the road, having more expense to keep them up. Now, what does the CSA mean to you? Well, transportation rates could rise. Uh, shippers, they must conduct checks of their carrier's safety rating and have an effective process for monitoring the carrier safety's performance. All righty, the highway, Senate Highway Bill. Congress faces a Saturday deadline, you guys, to issue either a short-term extension or a multi-year bill. Today being Wednesday, I don't think they're going to have a bill in place yet. I expect them to have a 10th extension in place. But if they let this expire, the government can no longer collect gas taxes. So I don't see that happening. But the uh, standoff is based on the differing views about the overall expense of the bill and how to pay for it. The bill funds transportation projects and also includes transportation policies. So the four things we're going to be watching is how many years of spending the bill authorizes, how much money, where is that money going to come from, and some of the policy issues. So let me point out some of those issues related to our freight industry. Electric onboard recorders. The goal of those is for compliance of the new hours of service regulation. However, owner operators oppose this for privacy concerns as it tracks where they drive. Another interesting thing you need to keep an eye out for is the driver detention rulemaking. Beginning next year, there will be rulemaking to discuss setting a max detention time and after that assess detention rates on a national level. For example, most of you have your own policies, two hours of loading and unloading free, three hours free, maybe $25, $50, $75 an hour after that. Well, they are discussing a nationwide um, level for that. The hours of service, I'm sure you've heard about this. 
Um, it is going to be effective July 1st, 2013, reducing drivers' work weeks from 82 hours to 70 hours. Now, this could result in slower transit times due to the less productivity and also reduced capacity as freight's going to be on the trucks even, even longer. Now, there's another good uh, regulation in place, which is called the Smart Port Act. The Customs Border Patrol is currently 100% scanning all ocean containers coming into our country, and they're considering a new import process that will be more risk-based driven on the import process for scanning. And then they're also looking at reforming the TWIC program. All right, so let's look at some international piracy. Piracy in Somalia is a booming business. There were 439 incidents of piracy worldwide in 2010, with 239 of them off the Somalia coast. In 2011, they took $160 million in ransom payments and killed 35 hostages. The average length of captivity is eight months. So ship owners have increased their use of private armed security forces that have prevented already 43% of attempted hijackings. Now half of all hostages though were subject to physical torture and some of those were even subject to pliers used to squeeze their fingers, even used to pull out their fingernails or get burned with cigarette butts and stand in the sun all day long. With so much money at stake, piracy is expected to continue to increase. The Generalized System of Preference. It is a program to design, designed to promote economic growth in the developing world by providing preferential duty-free entry for up to 4,800 products from 129 countries. The president signed legislation to reauthorize the GSP program through July 13, 31, 2013. Importers are able to recover duties, though, from January 1, 2011 to October 1, 2011, if you have not already done so. The merchandise processing fee is an entry fee charged by the Customs and Border Protection. Recent trade legislation which is H.R. 2832, changed the MPF on October 1, 2011 to 0.3464%, with a minimum of $25 and the maximum of $485. So that stayed the same, but when was the last time you really had a 65% tax increase? In perspective, a $140,000 commercial invoice value will hit the maximum in comparison to the previous $230,950 invoice value. Alrighty. Now, in conclusion, I wanted to give you a few takeaway tips uh, for you today, especially in this tighter capacity market. I would suggest that you benchmark and understand the marketplace. Review these annually by comparing yourself to the market averages. Gather business intelligence and improve your internal processes. Procurement exercise. Secure rates with promised capacity. Consider load optimizations and consolidations, and also look at modal conversions. Carrier-friendly freight. You want to dedicate lanes with, to carriers and also provide them with quick loading and unloading. You should also consider decent hours of operation for shipping and receiving and maintain the legal weight requirements. And finally, using a TMS to help automate and co-manage your logistics. TMS can provide the tool to gather reporting metrics, carrier scorecards for on-time delivery and pick, tender acceptances, and provide visibility of your shipments all on a single platform. So in conclusion, thank you for your attention, and let's go ahead and answer some of your questions. All righty. Looks like we do have a question here about hours of service. Could you please explain in more detail about the hours of service regulation? Absolutely. And um, in an effort to mitigate the accidents caused by driver fatigue, the FMCSA set rules to limit how long commercial drivers can actually operate a vehicle. 
So like I said, it's going to be effective July 1st, 2013. Um, they're going to be required, the driver is going to be required to take two 1 to 5 a.m. breaks and a 34-hour reset. And there's also going to be a mandatory 30-minute break within the first eight hours of driving. So they're going to reduce the work week ultimately from 82 hours to 70 hours, but they'll still have the 14 hours including loading and unloading in which 11 of those can be drive time and then they'll have to take that 10-hour break. So the drivers are concerned that the electronic onboard recorders that they are going to be asked to use to comply with the new hours of service regulation is going to also be able to physically track their uh, their presence. And also, those um, devices do cost a monthly GPS fee, which we are looking at about 100 bucks a month. So there are additional costs involved for the driver. Uh, any other questions? Alrighty, we do have a question here. Are we seeing increased rates for the 2013 contracts? Uh, depends on the mode. We are seeing um, slight increases for the over-the-road segment. We're thinking it's going to maintain about 3 to 5 percent. Uh, the LTL industry is going to always be a little bit heavier, um, especially since they lost a good bit of money down in the economic downturn. So we will see increased rates for 2013 continue with the um, LTL market. Don't know if it will continue to be as high as 6.9%, but it will be pretty darn close to that. Um, the international rates are definitely going up already. You know, we can see a 39% increase since the beginning of this year. And so those are going to um, continue to rise so that those losses that they surmounted in 2011 can be recovered. Um, Air freight, I also see that going up as well. Gas has helped keep that low, which is nice, but they're going to continue to see um, an increase in economic activity. So I feel like 2013 is going to be a slow and steady year for, um, for our transportation costs to go up a little bit. I feel like 2014, you guys, is going to be just like 2004, where it's going to be a little bit tougher. And so... Um, so be prepared, build those relationships with your carriers today, and make sure that you do have, um, have a procurement exercise every year. All right, uh, we do have another question. With truck capacity being so tight, what is M33 doing to make sure loads are covered? Well, what's nice is M33 has a, um, has a large resource of carriers in their network, they do have a brokerage division known as TransSource to support uh, capacity when needed. And so I feel confident in saying that M33 will make sure uh, there are going to be, you know, trucks out there. I don't know about the cost, you know, especially as it gets tighter and tighter in 2013, 2014, but we can definitely make sure that loads are going to be covered and if we have to consider modal conversions, that's what we will bring to our customers. We will propose, hey, we might want to consider putting this shipment on the rail, or can we go ahead and piece this into different multiple LTL shipments? Um, so that is another solution that we can provide. And so I think just having that kind of business intelligence, knowing where the marketplace is going, and having the security with those carriers, that relationship, we should be well protected in the future moving forward. Any other questions? Give you guys just a few more seconds for a few more questions. All righty. Well, hey, thanks so much for your participation. I enjoyed the polls, and thank you for your questions. If you do have any more questions or you would like to hear more about a specific topic mentioned this, in this presentation or also even if it wasn't mentioned in this, in this presentation, please contact me. My email address is listed on the screen, mattf at m33i.com or my phone number is 864-527-7958. Thanks again for your participation and we look forward to seeing you next month. Take care.